He was a child of the 20th century. As a young man, he yearned for a life of solitude. He became one of the towering figures of our time. He was the most popular and the most controversial pope of the century. His personality, his travels, and his decisions transformed the office of the papacy. His role in the collapse of the Soviet Empire has forever changed the course of history. He is John Paul II. Inner character defines the quality of the soul. By inner character, we mean a person's sense of his or her own place in the universe and the capacity to perceive that uniqueness universally in others. The man who did more than anyone else to situate human rights in the unique realm of personal human dignity was a surprisingly young cardinal from Krakow, Poland, Karol Wojtyła, who was elevated to the papacy in 1978. No other country is so gripped by its Catholicism than Poland. Their religion is the key to who they are. It was in this cradle of Catholic tradition that Karol Wojtyła, the future John Paul II, was born on May 18, 1920, in the small town of Warawica, some 50 kilometers, 30 miles, from Krakow, the cultural center of Poland. The youngest of three children, Karol's father was lieutenant in the Polish army, his mother the daughter of a cabinet maker. His sister died in infancy, leaving just he and his older brother Edmund. They lived in a modest apartment, just across a narrow road from the church. The church dominated the life and thought of this devout Catholic family. Carol's mother envisioned her son becoming a priest, but she would die when Carol was only eight. His mother had been gone only four years when tragedy struck again. His brother Edmund, a brilliant physician, contracted scarlet fever from a patient he was treating. His patient lived, Edmund did not. Now Carol had only his father, and they became inseparable. Carol was a handsome young man, outstanding in school, a tremendous athlete, the best soccer goalie in the area, but also quiet and sensitive to those who remember his childhood. He was a writer of poetry. Carol was 18 when he and his father moved to Krakow so that Carol could attend the university, where he enrolled to study philosophy and literature. They lived in a tiny basement apartment Carol once again excelled in his studies, and he also fell in love with the theater. He had a passion for drama. As an actor, playwright, director of plays, he imagined himself becoming an actor. He was developing the voice that would one day speak to the world, but he was not yet ready for the priesthood. What is essential for the priesthood is that the uh, the priest is acting in persona Christi, in, in the name of Christ himself. He is uh, offering his own sacrifice. I didn't have the awareness of my vocation after my maturity examination. That I have felt a little later. On September the 1st, 1939, the Nazis marched into Poland. Karol Wojtyła's world and that of everyone in Poland was turned upside down. Within days, the occupation was complete. The first victims of the Nazi occupation were the intelligentsia and the teachers. The university was closed, its faculty deported or shot. The Jews were next. Karol helped organize an underground theater to keep alive the sense of Polish national destiny and history, a form of opposition for which he too could have been executed. They met in secrecy. Carroll was able to get a job working in the nearby limestone quarry of the Solvay chemical plant. Backbreaking work, but it kept him from being deported to the labor camps in one of the Nazis' many sweeps of the city to round up able-bodied workers. While the world around him was being overrun with uncertainty and evil, God became Carol's refuge. He struggled with what to do as his world erupted in the most horrific evil he could ever have imagined. The fires of Auschwitz were only 17 miles away from his hometown of Wadawice. 
this great uh, suffering for the whole people, maybe that influenced it also. It done the, the, the direct examples of, of priests I, I met. I am very grateful to all of them who introduced me, humanly speaking. Karol Wojtyla finally embraced the call to the priesthood that he had been avoiding for a long time. In February 1942, Karol's father suffered a heart attack and died. The whole family was gone. Karol was 21 and completely alone in the world. He began instruction for the priesthood, though it was strictly forbidden by the Nazis. Young Carol risked execution as he attended secret seminary classes. In 1945, Poland was liberated, exchanging Nazi occupation for communist rule. The following year, on November the 1st, 1946, Carol was ordained Father Wojtyla. He would later recall that moment. It is with great emotion that I see myself lying on the floor of the private chapel of the Metropolitan Prince. I hear the hymn of the true creator, and I long for the laying on of hands. I accept the invitation to proclaim the good news and to lead my people to God and to celebrate the divine mystery. Young Wojtyla wanted to withdraw to a monastery but Catholic leaders saw more in the young priest. Two weeks after his ordination on November the 15th, 1946, Carroll was dispatched by train to Rome for 18 months of studies at the Pontifical Angelicum University. On an invitation to Carroll and the other students to meet Pope Pius XII, the young priest from Krakow paid his first visit to the mother church of all Catholics, St. Peter's. 120 years in the building, crowned by Michelangelo's domed frescoes, the largest basilica in the world. It would have been impressive to anyone. Little did Carol Wojtyla know this would someday be his home. In the summer of 1948, Father Wojtyla returned to Poland, first as a teacher of ethics at the Catholic University, and then for a short time as a parish priest. He would often take students canoeing or hiking in the mountains where he would teach them the great themes of Christian faith and life and listen to very real world challenges to the Christian experience from his students. Still in his 30s, he caught the eye of Poland's Cardinal Wojcicki, who put his name forward to become bishop. Meanwhile in Rome, the Pope who had led the Catholic Church across the troubled waters of World War II, Pius XII, died on October the 9th, 1958. When the 78-year-old Cardinal from Venice was elected, John XXIII surprised everyone with his vigor and his vision. He would live less than five years, but in that time, he would radically change the church. In 1962, Bishop Wojtyla was among those who gathered in Rome to take part in Vatican II charged with the dual task of bringing church tradition into relevancy with the modern world and seeking reconciliation among Christians everywhere. The council would revolutionize Catholic life and thought. Vatican II set the stage that would make the modern papacy of John Paul II possible, even thinkable. But before Vatican II could accomplish its task, Pope John XXIII died in June 1963, leaving to his successor, Pope Paul VI, the task of completing the council. As one of the most gifted and eloquent of the Vatican II delegates, the now Archbishop Wojtyla drew the attention of the new Pope. Paul VI was impressed. In 1967, by papal order, he became Cardinal Wojtyla. He was 47, and he was becoming recognized as papal material, as unlikely as that seemed for any non-Italian. When Paul VI died on August the 7th, 1978, it was the gentle and paternal Cardinal from Venice who was elected to succeed Paul. But John Paul I, as he chose to be called, lived only 33 more days. <laughs> 
the shortest reign of any pope in history. The cardinals, among them Carol Wojtyla, were again summoned to Rome. For the first time in nearly 500 years, the possibility was being considered that a non-Italian could be elected pope. The 120 men were locked in the Sistine Chapel, where they would remain until a new pope was elected. After each balloting, the crowds in St. Peter's Square would watch for the smoke from the Sistine Chapel chimney, black for no consensus, white when the new pope had been chosen. October the 16th, 1978. On the eighth ballot, on the second day of the conclave, at 4.30 in the evening, the crowd of 150,000 people looked up to see white smoke. Abemus Papam. We have a pope. Romane Ecclesiae Cardinalem Taking the name John Paul II in honor of his predecessor, the Pope from Poland was the first non-Italian pontiff in nearly 500 years, the 264th successor to the throne of St. Peter. Maybe that is a very difficult moment for me. It was not so difficult, perhaps uh, I admired, I, I was so surprised that it was so easy. <laughs> To accept that, of course, uh, in the spirit of a great, uh, of a great hope, of a great uh, confidence to our Lord, and uh, in this spirit, it, it was easier to find uh, the serenity, you know, of this moment. John Paul II came to the papacy at the age of 58, bringing with him more expectations, more hope, more faith in his capacity to do something utterly transformative than any single public figure in the 20th century. In the beginning, he did seem to be a man for our time, but he would soon emerge as a man at war with the 20th century. He is uh, called the first media pope, that is someone who really understood the importance of the media, understood the importance of charisma in part because of his gift of languages. He was able to communicate across all sorts of different, uh, different boundaries. But yet he was a very conservative pope. The pope's uh, point of view is that he is the guardian of the faith and that he, <clears throat> he is entrusted by tradition to uh, God, those temptations to uh, dilute it. He had lived in a culture of good and evil. He could see the worst possibilities of some of the modern questions, as well as the ideal response. I don't think we anticipated that. For John Paul, the fight was and is clear. It is between good and evil. John Paul had no trouble in identifying which is which in our world, and its strongest expression in 1978 was communism and the Soviet Empire. Be not afraid, John Paul had declared on his opening address as Pope. A year later, he returned in triumph to his homeland. Millions thronged to hear and see him. John Paul locked arms with a new movement called Solidarity and set about to see the communists driven from his homeland. The communists were so taken aback, they ordered the television cameras to stop panning the vast crowds. They saw their enemy and they were afraid. After that first trip, solidarity blossomed. Poles saw themselves again as a national unit. They knew they had power. Labor unions and workers began striking and protesting the communist regime. The Vatican was using its considerable resources to back the efforts, channeling funds to the Solidarity Movement, using its moral authority to attack the communist system at its weakest and most vulnerable places. A Polish Pope combined the efforts of the Roman Catholic Church with the efforts of, the, of Solidarity, the Union Movement that 
became such a force. The two melded together uh, in a way they became most inseparable. And the Pope, with tremendous diplomatic skills, great political skills, worked that, helped to build it, kept the pressure constant on against uh, communism, but never crossed over the line where that pressure could create a kind of implosion in Poland itself. I think it's very hard for people who didn't live through the period, and it will be very hard for future historians to understand what a, what a delicate and dangerous balance this was, uh, the effort the Pope led. In December 1981, the communist government struck back. Tanks and soldiers moved on the people. Martial law was declared. Hundreds of people were imprisoned. Many were interned. Tanks and soldiers were posted on almost every street corner. In 1983, John Paul returned in the midst of this dangerous time to encourage the faithful and confront the government. The communists backed down. In 1989, free elections were held in Poland. Solidarity was swept into power when Lech Wałęsa became president. It was the beginning of the end. Like a wildfire in summer, the flames of freedom would sweep across the landscape. Soon the Berlin Wall would fall and Germany would be reunited. Baltic states would press for independence. Within a decade, the USSR itself would cease to exist. Joseph Stalin once asked, how many divisions does the Pope have? The lonely seminarian had finally answered Stalin's question. The Pope's battalions may have been mere common men and women, but they possessed uncommon courage, and they obeyed a divine call to celebrate the God-given dignity of all mankind. In the end, that was enough. Those of us who remember the world before uh, have got to stop and remind ourselves, if not our children and our grandchildren, what a very different world it was when it was a bipolar world and the threat of communism was there. I mean, I, it was such a different world. And he was a child of that world, and he understood it. What the Pope uh, accomplished was a major factor in the decline and fall of the Soviet Empire. South America, with more than 500 million inhabitants, is home to half the world's Catholics, and one of John Paul's most controversial challenges early in his papacy. In the 1980s, many countries were torn between oppressive totalitarian regimes and right-wing Marxist revolutionaries who sought to overthrow their governments and free the people of their bondage. Many priests sided with the revolutionaries in their hope of helping the masses to rise above their pain and suffering. Their view became known as liberation theology. John Paul saw in liberation theology a compromise of the church's spiritual mission. John Paul set in motion a strategy to squelch liberation theology in Latin America. He closed several seminaries that had been hotbeds of liberation theology, schools, even churches, that had become clusters of Marxism within the church. The fires of liberation theology were put out. John Paul has been tireless in his office. For most of his papacy, he worked a 19-hour day almost every day. John Paul has traveled over a million miles as Pope to over 125 countries and spoken face to face to more people than any man in history in any one of the 12 languages he has mastered. What John Paul II showed was that the Pope is not just the leader of the Roman Catholic Church, but a global figure in his own right. Uh, and this pope has traveled probably to more countries than any leader of any church or probably of any nation in history. And uh, he has become uh, a, 
a global symbol for those who are not Roman Catholic. And he's become a player on the international stage. Uh, there are people who are critical of how much traveling he's done. They, they view it as kind of a, a road show that uh, generates a lot of momentary excitement, much like a rock concert or some other uh, celebrity superstar uh, appearance. But I, I think these things have had very, very deep uh, reverberations. The Roman Catholic Church is 900 million people strong, yet as diverse as each of the unique cultures in the places this pope has traveled. But John Paul sees his role to be an encourager of the church's mission of evangelism given it by Christ and never changed. Catholicism since certainly the late Middle Ages, absolutely since the Counter-Reformation, had been uh, a church that conceived itself primarily in institutional terms. Uh, and an institution is something to be maintained. Uh, John XXIII, the Second Vatican Council, and John Paul II have said no. There's an institutional dimension to the church. It's terribly important, can't ever lose sight of that. But the institution is to serve the mission of the church. And the mission of the church is evangelism. No sooner was he elected pope when he went up on the balcony of St. Peter's and said, Christ, Christ is the answer. Well, if you're an evangelical Protestant, if you're Billy Graham, because Billy Graham took note, my God, he's an evangelist. I mean, those were the words, and he has been. The end of his papacy, and throughout the last sort of 20, the last fourth of it, what did he talk about? evangelization of culture, evangelization of the people. So we come to the United States and talk about evangelism. The church is to evangelize. Perhaps there was another reason for John Paul to travel. He loved people, and everywhere he went, they loved him back. John Paul went to great lengths to try and bring human dignity to those on the margins of society, those the world would just as soon forget, but for whom Christ died, and to whom the church must be the bearer of his love and compassion. In 1986, he visited Mother Teresa at her home for the destitute and dying in Calcutta. You are not God's abandoned children, he told Calcutta's poorest of the poor, Quite the opposite. God will find joy in your faith and courage. No Christian leader of any generation has been as bold as John Paul to acknowledge the failures of those in the past who called themselves Christians, including those who were Catholics. In 1992, in a symbolic gesture of fellowship with those who suffered the humiliation of slavery, the Pope visited Senegal the main port of embarkation for over 20 million slaves shipped to the New World. I have come to pay my respects to all the unknown victims. We will never know exactly how many there were. Unfortunately, our civilization, which calls itself Christian, turned its back on the practice of slavery. There was no stronger theme in the papacy of John Paul II than that of children and young people. John Paul declared 1996 the year of the child. Perhaps the most visibly dynamic expressions of John Paul's papacy were the World Youth Days that began in 1985. When the Pope joined the 12th anniversary of those gatherings in Paris in 1997, 750,000 young people joined him from 160 countries 
to celebrate their faith. John Paul, more than any of his predecessors, earnestly sought to reconcile the Roman Catholic Church with other Christian traditions and other faiths. For John Paul, that began with the Jews. In April 1986, John Paul made his historic visit to the Jewish synagogue in Rome, ready to acknowledge the wounds inflicted on Jews by Christians, to reach out to them, calling them our elder brothers to begin a reconciliation with the people of Christ's birth, to tear down the spirit of anti-Semitism the church had so long nurtured, that in its own way had made the Holocaust possible and had made the death of so many of his childhood friends possible. No pope had ever made the short journey across the river from the Vatican. In his subsequent pastoral letter, read in all the churches of Poland, his position was clear. Anti-Semitism is a sin. One cannot be an anti-Semite and a Christian at the same time. John Paul has repeatedly reached out to other streams of the Christian church, affirming the shared brotherhood of those who, despite their differences on matters of doctrine, acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ. John Paul amazed many Protestants with an open declaration of apology to Martin Luther for the failure of the church to receive what Luther had intended to be constructive criticisms. He amazed many Catholics when he called Billy Graham his brother. For his part, Billy Graham has said of John Paul that he will go down in history as the greatest of our modern popes. Indeed, that John Paul is the strong conscience of the whole Christian world. In 1986, John Paul invited the leaders of the world's faiths to Assisi, birthplace of St. Francis, to address the common challenges and issues that face those who proclaim faith in God as central to their lives. It was also an opportunity for an apology to the world. I am ready to acknowledge that Catholics have not always been faithful to this affirmation of faith. We have not always been peacemakers for ourselves, therefore, but also perhaps in a sense for all this encounter at Axisi is an act of penance. As head of state of Vatican City, the smallest sovereign nation in the world, and the spiritual leader to nearly a billion people around the globe, John Paul II has received the world's great and powerful who have made the journey to Rome to meet him. There have been many celebrated visitors to the Vatican, often bringing special gifts to the Pope. Fidel Castro brought John Paul the gift he wanted most, an invitation to come to Cuba. In 1998, the Pope opened that gift when he landed in Havana, Cuba, and greeted Fidel Castro once again. Castro was just so deferential. But you could see with the uh, party, the uh, party committee that was there, including Castro's brother, they were um, in total consternation. I mean, they made no secret of it. They obviously did not think this was a good idea. It was uh, a moment in which the word, uh, humbly and winsomely and persuasively and persistently presented, uh, seemed to have what St. Paul calls the um, principalities and powers of the present time um, very much up against the ropes. John Paul has endeared himself to the world partly because he is so at ease with himself that he is equally at ease with everyone else. The pomp and ceremony which accompany the papacy often results in remote and detached leaders. But the leadership of John Paul has been notable for its accessibility and warmth. When Pope John Paul knelt to honor Cardinal Wyszynski, his mentor in Poland for so many years, he dramatically reversed tradition. 
was an embrace that moved the Catholic world. John Paul was never ashamed to let his emotions show or to laugh at something funny. One morning as he was preparing to speak from the balcony of St. Peter's, he was unperturbed when the doves of peace that were supposed to fly out from the Vatican window refused to go. They like staying at home, but they have to go forth and bring peace to the world. In New York City, the police wouldn't let the crowd have umbrellas unfurled for security reasons. John Paul helped lighten the misery. My first experience of celebrating Mass in the United States as Pope was Boston. And it was also a big rain. Water is a sign of life, a sign of God's blessing. He was always the master of improvisation. He puts you instantly at ease because he's so interested in who you are and what is the journey in which you find yourself at this point in your life. No one can doubt his sincerity. You can argue with his beliefs, ridicule them if you must, but you can't argue with his sincerity. In that, he and Billy Graham share that. It's a communicable sincerity combined with a communicable gentleness. This is a gentle man. Throughout his papacy, as evening would fall across Rome and Vatican City would grow quiet, John Paul, in his private quarters, would often take a modest evening meal with visitors. Then, without fail, he would quietly retreat to his private chapel to pray. You follow him into his private chapel, which is right next to the very modest little dining room where he eats. And there he has the Blessed Sacrament uh, reserved, of course, as Catholics do, and, and, uh, and a pre a kneeling desk. And he'll kneel there, and then he opens up, I've seen him do this, and he opens up uh, the top of the kneeling desk, which, and inside are just uh, piles and piles and piles of notes, scribbled notes. And these are notes given to him at audiences, for example, where there are thousands and thousands of people and they hand him a, a note and about uh, anything, about some relative who's sick or about someone who's considering a vocation to the priesthood or, or whatever. And he kind of um, just uh, meditatively works through all these, all these notes. Obviously, he can't be praying for everybody and, and uh, at the same time and with uh, full uh, focus and consciousness. But this um, box, if you will, on the top of his prayer desk um, kind of represents to me uh, uh, what is a very important thing to understand about his world and about his life, that he is the servant, totally uh, unqualifiedly at the service of the needs of humanity. The Pope is someone who is constantly praying. Uh, prayer is not something he does five times a day, seven times a day. It's something he does constantly. The deepest of his conversations is his ongoing conversation with God. Each day of his papacy, if he were not traveling, before dawn the lights in the Vatican papal residence were already on. By 6.15 a.m., John Paul had awakened and was at prayer, sometimes spending hours agonizing over the cares and concerns of the world he served. When he was traveling, he did the same, wherever he was. Once he told a visitor, you asked me how the Pope prays. He prays like every Christian. Sometimes he prays without words, and then he listens all the more. This Holy Father has demonstrated a real ability to live in the presence of God, and uh, that has to make for a great Pope.
John Paul has been the most public and the most accessible pontiff in the modern era. His love of people has often overridden concerns for protocol or personal safety. May the 13th, 1981 was a beautiful day to be in Rome. It was a bright, warm spring afternoon. John Paul was holding a general audience in St. Peter's Square, reaching out and touching the thousands of pilgrims, handshakes, waves, caresses for babies, connecting with the people as he always did. The shot was fired from less than 20 feet and passed perilously close to the Pope's heart. His would-be assassin, Ahed Ali Akar, a professional marksman, would later confess his disbelief that he had been unable to kill the Pope as though a higher power had prevented him. As he was rushed to the hospital, the 61-year-old pontiff prayed for his life. Within minutes, as the news flashed around the world, millions of others joined that prayer. John Paul hovered between life and death. Mahed Akar, the would-be assassin, was a Turk, part of a right-wing radical group dedicated to Turkish nationalism. When John Paul had visited Istanbul, this group had threatened to kill him. Was he operating alone or with others? To this day, no one knows, except perhaps for John Paul. In a remarkable display of Christian forgiveness, Immediately upon his recovery, the Pope insisted on meeting a car. They talked, they prayed, and John Paul forgave this young man. A car later would only say that the Pope now knows everything. In 1996, John Paul marked 50 years of service to the church with a celebration in St. Peter's Square with thousands of younger clerics, perhaps among them, a papal voice for a future generation. But despite his indomitable spirit, his body could no longer keep up. His fight with Parkinson's disease drained him of energy. In 1995, as he was delivering his Christmas blessing in St. Peter's Square, he could not finish his message. <sighs> You see, even the Pope has his weaknesses, but he's trying to resist. Thank you with all my heart for your patience. It was the beginning of the end. But even as his body has fought him, John Paul has continued to travel driven by a sense of mission to reach all of the Catholic world before he dies. Today, the energetic stride is gone, replaced by a stooping, cane-assisted shuffle. The white hair is thinner, and the once familiar smile is absent. His left hand trembles from the unrelenting attack of Parkinson's disease. His body bears the scars of innumerable surgeries, yet inside his failing body, the spirit of John Paul is still young and vibrant. His vision is still clear, though his own body has declared he will not live to see that vision realized. John Paul will cast a long shadow. He has appointed over a hundred of the 120 members of the College of Cardinals, the governing body of the Catholic Church worldwide, and the only ones who vote on who will be Pope. He has appointed more than half of the 4,200 bishops worldwide, taking care that his views on important issues will have a strong voice long after he is gone. At a general audience in May 1995 in St. Peter's, John Paul reflected on his life and his future. He told the people, I give thanks to God for being born and for being called on my particular mission. And above all, I renew before Christ my offer of willingness to serve the church as long as he wishes, abandoning myself totally to his will. I leave to him 
the decision as to when and how he wishes to relieve me of this service. He was not simply walking across the stage of history in a large way. The stage was moving with him. There are many who, who feel that he will go down in history as John Paul the Great, and I would not be surprised at that at all, uh, because he has had an enormous influence on the life of the church, not just in our century, but, uh, but long beyond. I think it's unquestionably true that he will go down as a great pope, because to steer the ch church through uh, the shoals, uh, the all the explosive ground that he had to steer it through much of the last half of the 20th century and into the 21st century, uh, it's inconceivable to me that having done that, that he won't be registered and held in very high esteem throughout history. He will go down in history as a great pope. Great in terms of great ideas, grand ideas, large ideas, and the intellectual wherewithal to address them, and great in terms of personal impact. He's a great witness to human possibility after a century of fear. Searching for a parable for the advent of the year 2000, John Paul drew upon the account of frightened Christians in St. Augustine's church when their city was under siege. The saint encouraged them with these words, do not be afraid. This is not an old world dying, but a new world being born. Do not be afraid. John Paul had spoken those words on the first morning of his papacy. Now, on the eve of the new millennium, he spoke them again to an unsure world on the threshold of the unknown. Those words had become the theme of John Paul's papacy. They were the signature of his own life. They are perhaps John Paul II's most powerful legacy to our world. He had said, those of you who already have the estimable fortune of belief, those of you who are still looking for God, and those of you who are tormented by doubt, do not be afraid to receive Christ and to accept his power. Do not be afraid. Throw open the doors to Christ for his redeeming power. Let state borders, economic and political systems, the vast fields of culture, civilization, and development be opened up. Do not be afraid. I beg you, I humbly and faithfully implore you, let Christ speak to man. He alone has the word, the way to eternal life.
For John Paul II, the very heart of all human rights in all cultures and civilizations, Christian or not, is the dignity of the human person. Billy Graham once said of Pope John Paul II that he is the strong conscience of the whole Christian world. Indeed, for this profound spiritual depth, this prayer life, his enormous intellectual universe, his compassion for the oppressed, and above all, his vision of how mankind should honor the God-granted dignity of every person on earth, we offer our own show of respect to Pope John Paul II. Thank you for watching this edition of the Footsteps of Faith video collection. Look forward to future editions in this series, bringing you powerful inspiration to challenge and deepen your Catholic faith.